Good morning, Sea Life. Good morning, Sea Life Online. We are so excited that you guys are here, and you are in for an amazing message by Pastor Paul McDill and some amazing worship. It was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, some announcements that we have going today are September 8th. All of our campuses have new service times, so they ha- they'll have an 8.30 service, a 10 a.m. service, and an 11.30 service. But starting September 8th, Kaufman's going to have a 5 p.m. as well. So if you need some evening church in your life, go to Kaufman. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know what? If you've ever thought about being a community group leader, now is the perfect time. And you don't have to do it alone. We have a campus pastor that's ready and willing to take you through resources and help you out. And it's an awesome opportunity to pour back into this community. So let us know if you're interested. You can go to sealifec.com and find out all the information there. Yep. Happy Sunday, guys, and enjoy the service. Awesome. <laughs> Still got 
got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense, and I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength, I built my life for Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful in every season. So why would he fail?
Yeah, yeah, you're going to make it through. I'm convinced about that. You're going to make it through. Uh, you're going to make it through. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what the circumstances look like, but I'm convinced you're going to make it through, not because you're so good, but because God is so God. Go ahead and take your seats. Go ahead and take your seats. Well, look, I am excited that you all are here today with us. Uh, one of the things that you can see and notice is I have a shirt on, and the town talks about a place for everyone because that's exactly what we get to be. Uh, we get to be a place for everybody. And you're going to see some people that's in the foyer that's going to have a shirt on that look a little bit like this as well. And I really want you to shoulder tap us. We want to do everything that we can to make sure that you're actually connected. We want to do everything that we can to make sure you're getting connected in your community group. So please reach out to us, shoulder tap us. If there's something that you want to start as a community group, look at the QR code, scan it. I'm telling you, we want to make sure that you have a plan, you have a vision. We want to make sure the community group is successful, but more importantly, healthy. So please do that. But outside of that, I do want to make sure that we're here today, we have the right spirit. So let's say this. Over the week, my family and I, uh, we experienced something that's pretty, I don't know, it was interesting, but this is just how God was posturing me. So uh, my, my, my wife and uh, my son, my oldest son, they, they were in the restroom. And here's what I did. I left the door open just uh, too long. I left the door open too long because I was outside doing some work. Left the door open, go into the restroom, and my wife and the son, they're, they're screaming. Come to find out, uh, as I left the door open, uh, a lizard gets into the bathroom. Lizard gets into the bathroom, and when I find out there's a lizard in the bathroom, I actually go and I, I take care of the lizard, get rid of the lizard. The next day, I tell my son, I said, hey, I want you to go in the bathroom. I want you to uh, start washing your face. I want you to start brushing your teeth. And I'm telling you, he's looking at me terrified. Because all he could see is this illusion, if you will. But what he did know is his father had already worked out what he was trying to figure out. And can I just tell you, I think sometimes we come into the church house and we have all type of distractions and all type of burdens and all type of situations. But can I just echo that God the Father has already worked out what we're trying to figure out. And I'm just saying that's one of the reasons why I love coming here collectively. Because yes, we get to work, worship God collectively. But the beautiful thing is we know him personally in different ways. There's some people here that recognize God to be a healer. There's some people that recognize that God is a way maker. God is a provider. God, he's with me. He's my friend when I'm grieving. He, he's with me in so many different ways. And can I just tell you, God never stops being God. So what's our assignment? We get to do worship. We were designed to worship because he's worthy of all the worship. And so here's what's going to be really beautiful. In a moment, we're going to sing a new song. And it's entitled, Who Else? Who, who else? It's really a profound question, and it's just one simple answer. Who, who else can make ways out of no way? God. Who, who else can heal your body from aches and pain? God. Who, who, who else can steward a marriage better than me? God. Who, who else can be a friend when it seems like I'm lonely? It's only God. And can I just tell you, right now in this moment, we get to bask in that very truth. Let's step back up, y'all. Dear God, we thank you so much for being God and not needing any help on being God. God, we ask that in this moment you allow us to just bask in your presence and recognize that you're sovereign. God, allow us to just bask in your mercy, bask in your love, God. God, because right now we need you more than we've ever needed you before. In Jesus' name. I am an instrument of exaltation And I was born to lift your name above all names You hear the melody of all creation But there's a song of praise that only I can bring Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is no one, only you, Jesus. Who else is worthy? Who else is worthy? There is. 
my shepherd and he is everything I need so I will not worry 
And I will not fear the enemy He said that He loves me He said that He's with me Even though I walk through the valley Of shadow and death And still I know He has good plans He has good plans for me so I will take heart in deserts and gardens He has If I know my Father, I know my Father has good plans Through it all I will trust in You alone Yeah Savior, so why should I doubt the victory, and why would I question the rod and the staff that comforts me? He quiets the waters, He quiets the storm inside of me, and what could be better than walking with Him when I
Let's lift some praise to the faithful Father. You were the word at the beginning. One with God and the Lord Most High. You hid in glory in creation. Now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The
Church, we're going to sing this together one more time. And I just feel a call in this room right now to a surrender to the Holy God. Complete surrender. Complete surrender. So um, the Bible talks about this. And if you're comfortable, I want to invite you to lift your hands together. And this is just surrender with our body, with our hearts, with our word, and with our mind to the name that is above every other name. Let's sing it together. You're holy. You're holy. Worthy is the Lamb, and you are holy, you're holy, are you Lord God Almighty, you're worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb. you are holy, oh you're so much better. You're so much better than everything. Set apart, worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise. You are God. You are creator. You are savior. You are beginning and end. And we are your created. So let your created respond in worship. You're worthy of it. And you're not a God that's just in control and distant and harsh and removed and demands. But you're a God that is close and sees and loves. So draw our hearts to worship what we were created for. Draw us to that. Let your living and breathing word move in this place today. Draw our affections and our submission to you. We want more, we want more, we want more. Let us hunger and thirst for the presence and the goodness of our God above everything else. May we delight in the way that you move in this place today and may we respond to it. We pray all of these things through the name of Jesus Christ and the church said, amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Well, welcome. We're glad that you're here today. I want to say welcome to you. I want to say welcome to those of you joining us online. We are so honored to have you with us. Uh, we know we have people joining from all over the world, from Ghana and Guatemala and uh, military bases around the world, as well as the Kaufman County Detention Center. So thanks for being with us. Uh, we hope that God will move in your life today as well. As those of us that are in the room, my, is my time up? Am I? Uh, there we go. We got lights. Uh, we're glad that you're here. We are in this series called More Like Jesus. This is week three. If you missed the first two weeks, I would encourage you to go back and, and listen or watch. Um, the first, let me just give you a little bit of catch up. Week one, we talked about the fact that Jesus would come alongside people and say, come and follow me. And miraculously, they would do it. Like they would leave everything that they had and they would go and follow Jesus. They would leave their boats and their jobs and their families and just follow after Jesus. And if you were with us week one, um, we explained that a little bit that while that doesn't make a lot of sense to you and I, in their day, they had a framework for that. Because that was part of the educational process. Once you got done with what we would consider like high school, um, if you were advanced enough, you would make an application to to be under the the tutelage of a rabbi. And you would be in an apprenticeship if you got accepted. And that was like the best of the best of the best. It was like getting accepted to Harvard. You would go under this tutelage of a rabbi. And Jesus, often they referred to him in in his early days of ministry as rabbi, which just meant teacher. And so if you went under the tutelage of a rabbi, um, there were three things that would happen. The first is that you would be with the rabbi 
Like 24-7, you were around them all the time. You would eat dinner with them. You would eat lunch with them. You would eat breakfast with them. You would sleep near them. You would walk alongside them as they went from town to town. You would be in conversations with them. You would hear them talking to other people. It was, you were with the rabbi. And then the second thing that was supposed to happen is you were supposed to become like the rabbi. And then third, you were supposed to do as the rabbi did. And so last week, that was week one, last week we talked about the fact that they would be with Jesus every single day. And that seemed like an easy thing to do when Jesus was there physically. But before Jesus left, he told his disciples, hey, I'm going to leave, but don't be saddened because When I leave, another is coming, another helper, one that's like me, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he will dwell with you. And in fact, he told the disciples, you need to know that this is actually to your advantage. Like you're gonna be better off when I'm gone and the Holy Spirit's here here than you are when I'm here. And maybe you've lived your life and there've been times that you thought, You know, I would follow Jesus too if I would have been there with him presently. Like if I would have been one of the disciples during his time on earth, I I would really follow Jesus too. But that's not what Jesus said. Jesus said actually that you have an advantage over the disciples in the day that Jesus was there because you have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. And so last week we talked about being with Jesus and today we're gonna talk about becoming Jesus like Jesus. And I I don't know if you know this or not, but it's God's will and his destiny for you to become like Jesus. That's God's plan for your life, that you would become like Jesus. And there are certain Christians, and I don't know if you know them, uh, if you know anybody like this, but I know some of these people, like you know anybody that it just feels like they are on another level spiritually? Like, you know any of those Christians that you look at their lives and you're just like, wow, I don't know if I could ever be like that. Like, you, you know, like they're, they're kind. Like when they open their mouth, kind words come out. And you're like, I'm, I'm kind of moody, you know? And they're, they're patient. Like they just exude patience. And, and they're disciplined. And they're humble. Don't you hate people like that? You know, you're like, ah, oh, it just it just seems so easy for them. And when you're around them, like you you start to feel bad about yourselves, don't you? That this is why I hang out with people like David and Randy. Um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. But but you know what I'm talking about? You know those people that you're like, man, I, I just feel bad when I'm around them because I, I don't I don't think I could ever be like that. You just get discouraged. I don't feel like I'll ever get to the place where those people are. I'll never be like Jesus the way they are. But the scriptures teach us otherwise. In fact, if you have your Bible and you want to open to Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and and 30 here as we kick off this morning. And, And I just want you to understand, it feels like we've been talking about this idea a lot, but but as we look at this passage, Romans 8, 29 through 30, it says, For those whom he foreknew... He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's several key phrases in here or key ideas that I want us to look at. You, you see this word right here, justified. And this word justified says when you, when you become a Christian, God looks at you differently. In fact, um, I, I want us just to think about it like this. This word justified, if you think about because of the cross... You were pronounced, that's supposed to be a megaphone right there. Does that look like a megaphone? Just a, thank you for, that's beautiful, I heard that. (laughs) Sounded a little sarcastic, if I'm going to be honest. Okay, good. Thank you. You're very encouraging down here. We need more of you. It, it, what, what does it mean to be justified? It means that God pronounces over you that you are holy and righteous. That you are seen as right in the eyes of God. That that is a big deal. 
Nobody seems to be that excited about it here in the room. I hope some of you online are a little more excited about it than these people, but that's a really big deal that you are justified in the eyes of God. You are pronounced holy and righteous because, not because of what you've done, not because of your merit or because of your work or because you showed up for church this morning, but because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, you are justified in the sight of God. And that's a big deal. And then he goes on and he, he, not just are you justified, and it feels like we've talked about this a lot lately, but not just are you justified, but you're, you're being sanctified. And that word sanctified means that there are things changing about you. And this, this says that you're to be conformed to the image of his son. That's what it means to be sanctified, that God is conforming you to the image of his son. Now, now you probably know this, and I'm not gonna put this on you, um, but my guess is for most of us in this room, we would say, okay, I get justified. I was justified in an instant. The moment I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ, I was made pure and holy in the sight of God. But this sanctified part, um, anybody feel like it's not happening as fast as it could? Like, you know, you know like life tells us that like, I get that God is sanctifying me, but, but God is sanctifying me and it's a process. And because of sin in our lives and because of the flesh, we're not gonna be fully sanctified until we see Jesus. And that, that's what this word right here, glorified. Whom he justified, he also glorified. It's this, this word glorification. And we all agree with that, right? Like anybody in here that would just say, want to say, hey, don't, don't speak for me, Paul. Like I have been sanctified completely. My, I wake up in the morning and my spouse says, oh, you look just like Jesus today. <laughs> anybody anybody want to object to this and just say, hey, I don't, I don't fit that being sanctified quality. Like I've already, it's already happened for me. I've made it, I've arrived. Any, anybody just go ahead right now, show your hand. Okay, we're all on the same page then that this is going to happen in the future. We will be glorified. But I want you to see something that's really important in this passage. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. It says it again, and those whom he predestined. If you look at that word predestined, what do you see in there? You know what you see? You see the word destiny, don't you? It's, it's your destiny, to become like Jesus Christ. That's what God is doing in your life. He is transforming your life. And and that process won't be perfected until you pass from this life into the next. But he is about it in your life. It is the process of sanctification, of conforming you to the image of Jesus. And for everyone in Christ, this is your destiny, that you would be conformed to the image of Christ. And so how is it that that happens in our lives. How do you become more like Jesus? That's what I want us to spend the rest of the time talking about. How do we become like Jesus? How do we see that work out in our lives? And, and I wanna work through this uh, with this framework. I'm gonna give you three misconceptions. And in those misconceptions, uh, I'll also teach you like what the truth is. And the first misconception, I think it's John Mark Comer in this series came from a guy named John Mark Comer, his book, Practicing the Way, great book. I would encourage you to read it. I think it's him that calls it this, he calls it this first misconception, the zap from heaven. Zap from heaven. Now, how many of you have an iPhone? Anybody? There's like four of us. That's, I thought they were doing better than that. Um, I know there's other types of phones and this probably works for that too, like all you people that annoy us when we have you in a group message. But you know, you know, here's what happens with my iPhone. In fact, this popped up on my Twitter feed the other day that I don't know if you know this, but there is a new iOS that's coming out here. I think it's a few weeks, maybe a month or so, a new operating system for your iPhone. I think it's iOS 18 or something. And, and here's what's gonna happen. If you're set to update automatically, you will go to bed one night 
And the next morning you will wake up and it will say a new iOS has been installed. Welcome. It'll have little graphics and it'll say, you know, here's how to, or let's explore what's new or something creative like that where you, and it, you'll scroll through and it'll pop up and it'll show you these little different things. I was reading about it the other day. There's some pretty cool stuff in there. I'm already a little annoyed. Like uh, supposedly Siri is going to become more advanced or you might call it more nosy in your life. Anybody else feel like Siri's giving them too many instructions these days? Two nights ago, it popped up. Thank you. Um, two nights ago, it popped up on my screen like, you need to leave now for your reservation. It's like, mind your own business. I'll leave when I'm ready, you know? And, uh, you know, but, but, but it's, gonna, it's gonna even get more advanced and here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna go to bed one night and overnight, Apple is going to download into your phone a new operating system, and the next day it's going to be different. And there's a lot of people that think that's the way spirituality works as well. You become a believer in Jesus Christ, and one day you go to bed, and while you're asleep at night, God just zaps you with this update from heaven. And all of a sudden you look like, act like, talk like, or just like Jesus. Jesus. And that's not the way it works. That is a misconception. You, you hear people pray prayers like this sometimes. They'll say, God, would you just take away my anger? And I'm not saying that's a bad prayer. I don't think that's a bad prayer. But here's the reality of the situation for, for most of us is you did not get that anger overnight. Like you grew up watching your parents model it. You were in uh, situations and experiences that, that taught you that that's how you respond with anger. And it has been deeply ingrained in your life and there are deep roots. And here's what I want you to understand. It's probably not gonna go away overnight. It's not gonna be some zap from heaven. In fact, the scripture tells us that spiritual growth is a lot like physical growth. Look at what it says in 1 Peter chapter two. It says, like newborn infants long for spiritual pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. Do you see that? It, it, it creates this um, comparison of spiritual growth to physical growth. And how do you grow physically? Do you just one day wake up and you're six foot tall? No, it's a long, slow process, right? Right? That's, what, that's the truth about how you grow. It's not gonna be from zap from heaven. It's not gonna be some zap from heaven. It's gonna be a slow incremental change. And daily growth, and I don't know if you recognize this, but daily growth is inobservable. Like you, you see that if you're a parent, right? Like you, you, you have a kid and that your kid's uh, four years old and you've been with them every day for the last four years, it seems like, nonstop, and, and they're just a four-year-old, but you show up to your family reunion that you hadn't been at in two years, and some aunt is going to say, oh my gosh, look how big he's gotten. And you're like, I didn't notice, because you've been watching every single day, and it was happening slowly, and that's the way spiritual growth is. And I think sometimes we have some unrealistic expectations that come from our interpretations of scripture. We read in the Bible about how Jesus healed people and he, he healed a blind man on the spot and he could see. And he healed a lame man on the spot and he healed a deaf person on the spot just like instantly they were healed. But, but here's what I would say, those things happen and you see those miracles that take place in the Bible. And so our temptation is to think, God, do that, touch me, heal me. And there are dozens of examples of Jesus healing people's bodies, but there aren't any recorded stories of him healing people's character overnight. In fact, you, you need to look no further than Jesus' own disciples to see that. You know, you know Jesus' own disciples, they've been with Jesus uh, three years, for three years, hanging out daily with Jesus. And at the end of that three years, James and John, they selfishly asked Jesus if they can sit at his right and his left. Peter denies even knowing Jesus. Thomas doubted the resurrection. These are the guys that have been with him for three solid years and, and their change did not happen overnight. It was a slow, long progress. And those were the disciples. 
The second misconception is this. The second misconception about how spiritual formation happens is we think that spiritual formation will happen if we just have more Bible study. But you, 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 it feels like in some churches, every answer to every sin problem is more Bible study. It's kind of like that old Saturday Night Live skit. Remember that old Saturday Night Live skit, More Cowbell? Like, I just got to have more cowbell. And it feels like, hey, I've got this sin, and so, so what do I need to do? I, I need to, to read the Bible more. And I, we're for reading the Bible around here, but it doesn't matter how hard you're hitting Bible study if you're still struggling with sin. The answer is not just more Bible study. In fact, it's very rare that the hang-ups and sin problems that we encounter along our spiritual journey are because we don't know something in the Bible about it. Let me just prove it to you. This is, uh, this is not gonna, I hope this doesn't embarrass anybody. Um, you don't, just keep your hand down if it's gonna be too embarrassing to you. But does anybody in here struggle with anxiety or worry? Just anybody in here ever? Just hold them up high. Let, like, if you're not, yeah, there you go. Look, I mean, you shouldn't be embarrassed. There's a lot of people, right? Uh, just hold it, hold it, keep it up for a minute, okay? Like the people that have some, they struggle with anxiety and worry. But let me ask you this. No, hold it up. Don't, I saw some people putting their hands down. Just keep it up. Are you getting tired? Is that, I mean, now those of you that struggle with worry and anxiety, have you ever read the verse in Matthew chapter six, this chap, this verses where Jesus talks about, I see y'all putting your hands down. <laughs> you ever read those verses where Jesus talks about like who can add any height to their frame by worrying or any time to their life by worrying anybody anybody like with your anybody holding your hand up that has never heard those verses like just hold your hand now you can put them down unless you haven't heard those verses those verses are new to you like you never knew that jesus said don't worry because it doesn't help now y'all are healed right like you you know those verses for most of you you know what the problem was like you you worried, but it wasn't that you didn't know that verse, was it? Like, like that verse did not just, you did not just go, oh, wow, it's over. Anxiety is cured. Now I know because I, there's a Bible verse where Jesus said, don't worry, because it, it's, it's more complex than that, isn't it? Now you know the passage and you still worry. Why? Because knowing and believing the right truths, while essential, is not enough. Look at what James said. James, and, and, and he starts this verse, I didn't, don't have this in here, in James chapter one, verse 22, he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You know why he says that? Because people like you and I that come to places like this, we have a tendency to deceive ourselves. Like we have a, a tendency to, to sit and listen and say, oh wow, Anybody ever sit in a sermon and you, you hear something and you go, oh, wow, this is where you should do this. Like, oh, yeah, that happens all the time. Happened four times already today, Paul. Um, something like that. But, but anybody do that? Like you ever sit in a sermon and go, oh, wow. But, but the Bible says, James was saying, we have a tendency to hear those things and go, oh, wow, and think that now our lives will be blessed because we just heard something. Like you'll go to the mall and the best parking spots will just open up. You'll take a test and you'll just ace it automatically because you went, oh, wow. And then he goes on and look at what he says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. You know what Jesus is saying? Like he, He's saying, hey, and, and you gotta keep in mind, in those days, they didn't have mirrors the way we have mirrors. They would take metal and they would polish it up like bronze or silver or sometimes even water and it was like a reflecting glass for them and they would look at it and Jesus is saying, this is like a person who looks in the mirror. You ever look in the mirror and go, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Like, ladies, you, you carry whole bags with you when you travel, right, to take care of that, oh, wow. 
Like, oh, wow, uh, my wife and I, I have this little statement that we're not making, I'm not making fun of anybody, but sometimes we'll be out somewhere and we'll see like a, a lady that like is wearing something that like, I will say to my wife, I'll say she either needs a mirror or a friend, you know, like maybe a friend would tell her like, you can't wear that, but a mirror would maybe help because she would go, oh, wow. And he's saying like someone, somebody that listens to the word that sees the truth of God's word, but does not into a, put it into practice. They're like a person who looks in the mirror and goes, oh, wow, I need to shave. And then they walk away from there and don't shave and they go to work and somebody says, hey, did you shave this morning? Like, no, but I saw it in the mirror. And then they come home and they go to CG that night and somebody says, man, did you shave? And they're like, no, I saw it in the mirror. Would you pray for me that I would shave? Like that God would take care of this. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's saying, look, that if you just see it, but you don't do anything, it doesn't change anything. And then he goes on and I love the way he says this, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law, the perfect law that gives freedom. Isn't that beautiful? And continues in it not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it. They will be blessed in what they do. It's the doing it that changes you. It's the doing it that changes your life. It's the doing it that makes you more like Jesus. It's not just that you need to learn more. In fact, there's a great big gap in most of our lives between what we know and what we do. It's not a problem of more knowledge. It's a problem of doing what we already know we should do. Jesus talked about it like this, Matthew 5, 19, right at the start of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, whoever practices, whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, look at what he says. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, and what does he do? And puts them into practice. It's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. He was saying, look, it's not just about learning more. It's not just about being exposed to more truth. It's about practice. It's about doing what you've already been taught that you should do. For most of us, what we need more than more knowledge, what we need more than more scripture, and we're all for learning more scripture around here. We think you ought to be learning more scripture. But what's more important than that is that you put into practice what you actually know in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse, um, verses 7 and 8. It says, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths, but rather what? Rather train yourselves for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also the life to come. It says, train yourself for godliness. Uh, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for what? And for training in righteousness. See, the, the reality is that for most of us, it's not that we need to try harder. It's that we need to train for godliness. You you understand the difference between trying and training? Trying is like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to figure out a way to do it. Like if you've never run more than a couple of blocks, like you've never actually run a mile, like I'm talking about at one time, I'm not talking about the cumulative effect of all the times you chased your kid down the row at Walmart. I'm talking, and you just add them all up and go, well, that's probably a mile. I'm talking about if you've never ran, gone out and ran like a mile, and you're sitting on the couch this afternoon, and you, and you just have this thought and go, man, I think I'd like to run a marathon. That sounds like it's from the Holy Spirit. It's Sunday, after all. Chick-fil-A's closed. Must be the Holy Spirit. I'm going to run a marathon. And then you pull out your laptop, and you go, huh, are there any marathons happening next weekend? because I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna try really hard to run a marathon. That's not a good plan, is it? If you're gonna run a marathon and you've never run a mile and you actually want to run a full 26.2 miles, you better start training. That means next, you know, tomorrow you, you run two blocks. And then you add to that and your, your marathon's not gonna happen for six months or for a year. 
And it's not just in physical activity that this is true. This is true in any area of our life, isn't it? Like if you want to play Bach on the piano and you want to be a concert pianist and you think, well, you know, what I'll do is I'll just show up at a concert hall and get a lot of people there and sit down at the grand piano and start playing, that's not going to be a good idea. You've, you've got to train. You know what train means? That means you start playing scales on the piano. And maybe you're saying, well, well, scales, Paul, that sounds like that'll be too slow. And here's what I'm telling you. That's not the slow way. Scales is the fast way. Running two blocks tomorrow is not the slow way to run a marathon. It's the fast way to run a marathon. Because if you show up next week at the marathon, you'll run about a mile and a half, and then you'll quit, and, and you'll wait until you've forgotten how painful that was, and it might be six months from now when you'll go, oh, you know what? I think it's the Holy Spirit. I'll go run a marathon today. I'm going to try again. And you'll show up, and you might run a mile and a half again, and you'll keep doing that for decades until you decide you're going to train. What would training look like? What does spiritual training look like? Let's use our worry example. Because for many people, telling them not to be anxious is like telling them to go run a marathon. And live life free of worry. We have to become the kind of people who've learned to trust God so deeply we can live without fear. And so you might read the scripture or listen to a sermon on Matthew chapter 6, Jesus' famous do not worry text and then you carve out some time alone with God and you begin to pray and identify things that you worry about and maybe it's over the course of several weeks you start keeping a list of these are all the things I worry about and then you pinpoint what's the underlying fear underneath all of that worry and are there some truths in God's word that I can combat that fear with and you begin to look up those truths and those verses you start to memorize them and over time, when those worries or those fears start popping up, you're, you're able to just go back at them with truth from God's word. And you find some community around your life. And you begin talking about it to some other people and saying, this is what, man, this fear just begins to overwhelm, and overwhelm me in my life. And it causes me to be anxious. And so I want to give you permission to challenge me when you see that I'm living in fear. And all of a sudden, one day you say something and they go, is that fear or faith talking? And you're training. And you see the difference. The third misconception or wrong approach to spiritual transformation is willpower. And you, you may be saying, well, wait, I thought willpower was good. I thought we're supposed, to, we're supposed to have willpower. But here's the reality. You will never have enough willpower to overcome the darkest desires and urges of your life. One willpower runs out. Did you know that? Like there's lots of scientific studies about this. They did a study at Stanford some time ago, and they took these two groups of students, and these two group, they, they divided these students into two groups, and, and they had them all memorize a number. And it was a, a number that any, everybody could do. Like one number, one group memorized a two-digit number, and one group memorized a seven-digit number. Now, you can do either one of those, right? Two-digit doesn't take very long at all. Seven-digit might take you a few minutes to, to really get that down. You're going to have to work on it a little bit. And then they had them come back to another room to recall the numbers that they were supposed to memorize. But on the way to recall those numbers, they, they, had, a, a play, they had them sit down in a place and they offered them a snack. And they had their choice of a snack. They could either take a fruit cup or they could take a piece of chocolate cake. And did you know that they found out that the people that had to memorize the longer seven-digit number, they were twice as likely to take the chocolate cake? Because our willpower runs out. That's why, and I know you thought they were stupid when your parents told you nothing good happens after midnight. But it doesn't sound so stupid now that you're a parent, does it? Because willpower runs out. And willpower will run out of your life as well if you're trying to 
pull yourself up, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Just overcome it in your own strength. What you need is a transformation from the inside out that only God can do. I love what it says in Psalm chapter 37, verse 4. Psalm 37, verse 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. I love that because I think that's what transformation looks like in our life. We, we think a lot of times that what it means to look like Jesus is that all of my bad urges just go away. Like I, I, just, I just have to lose any passion I have. But what scripture teaches is no, as you delight yourself in the Lord, um, those, those urges, those passions are replaced with passions for him. The delights of your heart change. So it's not like I've got I've to really work hard at this and I've got to grind more to get more like Jesus. It's like, no, God changes you from the inside out as you change, as you train. And I just want to encourage you in that today. I've been struggling all day with how this message ends. And here's how it ends, and I just want to encourage you in this that the change that God's looking for in your life, the change that you're destined for, has to come by the transformational power of Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that can do it in your life. And if, if you walked into this place today and you've got these struggles and you've got these things um, going on in your life and you thought, maybe I'll come in there and they'll give me some advice for some things that, you know, that I can start taking control of my life. That's not what we're about in this place at all. In fact, we're totally against you taking control of your life because you can't do it. You cannot control your life. The only hope you have is to relinquish control of your life to the life-changing, transformational power of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, there is an incredible promise that we started with today, and that's that that becomes your destiny. So don't be discouraged because it is your destiny. A while back, probably, I don't know, it's been 18, 20 years ago now, started watching this show called 24. Anybody in here know the show 24? A guy named Jack Bauer. Are you familiar with Jack Bauer? Everybody here should know Jack Bauer. You would not be here if it was not for Jack Bauer. <laughs> Counterterrorism unit it, stationed in Los Angeles. And the show 24 would work like this. It was called 24 because it would, the, every season would be one 24 hour time period. So it was all happened in one day. So it's fast and furious, and this guy, Jack Bauer, an amazing agent for the counterterrorism unit, um, I, I, I don't understand why they kept doubting him throughout the seasons. Like, I'm like, this guy's done enough. We should trust him by now. But they did keep doubting him. So I started watching this show in season four. When I heard about it, I heard them talking about it on the radio, and they kept, like, singing its praises. So I was like, this sounds really good. This sounds like something I'd like. So one Monday night, I turned it on. This is when you watch TV, like, when it happened at 8 o'clock on a Monday night. And I turned it on and watched this show, and I was like, wow, that was good. And at the end of it, it was the most intense thing you would ever see on any given week. They would start clicking down the seconds of the clock, and there would be something that happened that was like a cliffhanger that would make you be like, I have to wait a week to watch what's going to happen here. And so we started, um, we watched the rest of that season, season four, and then we decided to go back and watch the seasons that were prior to that. So my wife and I started renting the seasons at Blockbuster. Do you remember Blockbuster? <laughs> Tell your kids about Blockbuster after the service. We would go to Blockbuster, we would rent a whole season. It should have cost like, you know, $20 for the whole thing. We would end up paying $130 because that's how Blockbuster worked, right? You never, if you took a movie back on time, like you were the exception, okay? And so we start watching, we watch season one, we watch season two, we watch season three, and in season three, I think it was, I'm watching and at one point there's some guys that have captured a nuclear warhead, I think they were from Russia, Jack chases them down, he's pursuing them, they know that like this nuclear warhead is missing, he 
gets a lead on it. He falls to this old abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere. And he's sitting up on the hill outside this fence. He's kind of laying there. He's got his backpack and he pulls out his little telescope and he's looking down there and he takes out his phone and he calls his assistant, Chloe. And he says, Chloe, I've got a lead on him. I'm right here. I can see him. I need you to pull up the satellite imaging. And Chloe rearranges a satellite out in space somewhere. Miraculously, all of a sudden, she can see what's going on at this place. And it's got thermal imaging. And she's like, Jack, I see 25 of them. And they're heavily armed. And he says, well, Chloe, I need backup. And and she says, okay, I've called backup. And he says, how long do they get here? And she says, Jack, it'll be 12 minutes. And he says, Chloe, we don't have 12 minutes. And I'm like, he's right. We don't have 12 minutes. There's no way we can wait 12 minutes on this. And she says, well, Jack, there's too many of them. You got to wait. And he says, Chloe, I'm going in. And she says, no, Jack, don't do it. There's too many of them. And I'm like, no, Jack, don't do it. There are too many of them. You can't go. And he says, I'm going, Chloe. And he hangs up the phone and he starts taking off. And I'm like, Jack, do not do this. And then I remembered that I had seen season four. I'm like, he's going to be all right. <laughs> and I love that verse in Romans 8 so much. It says, God has already determined what's going to happen with your life. It's already been predetermined. It's predestined. It is your destiny that you are going to be transformed into the image of Jesus. And so what do you do? You yield control to him. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your good promises, God, that we can trust that you're going to do what you promised you would do. You know, maybe there's somebody here in this room today. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed and And you would say today, man, I don't, Paul, I know I don't have that. I don't have that power inside me. And I recognize today that I've never come into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And this this time right here, this, this next minute is just for you. If you've never made that decision to trust God with your life, to trust Jesus Christ, to trust in the fact that he died on the cross for your sins and he rose from the grave to give you eternal life and you want to do that today, I'm not going to do anything to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out or anything like that. I just want to pray with you. And so if that's you and you've never made that decision before and you want to make that decision today, would you just look up here at me? Just make eye contact with me. I see you right there. Awesome. I see you right there. Awesome. Awesome. I see you. Awesome. Awesome. People all over the room. Others. You more right here in the middle that you've never made that decision. Are you looking at me? Awesome. I just want to pray with you. And this isn't a magical prayer. It's a really simple prayer of just surrendering your life to God. Just right there in the silence of your own seat, you don't have to say it out loud. You would just say something like this, God, today I trust you with my life. And I recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins. And so today I receive your free gift salvation and eternal life and I ask you to take control of my life God for all of us today would you help us to just give you control and let you do what you promised you would do in our lives and I pray this in Jesus name Amen. Hey, can we just praise God today for people who gave their lives to Jesus Christ? So we're going we're gonna to dismiss here in just a second, and I want you to know there are prayer partners that will be right up here. And if, if, that's, if that was you, like if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, 
They would love to talk to you about what a next step might look like for you. They're not gonna embarrass you. They would love to pray with you and talk to you about what might be the next thing for you to do. And if, even if that's not you, even if there's just something else going on in your life, our prayer partners would love to pray with you today. Thank you for being here today. Thank, you're dismissed. We'll see you next week.